So this presentation and what we'll spend the next 30 minutes or so going through, I'm going to basically cover off soil fertility under four main headings. One, just looking at soil and its importance, and its importance first of all, and then maybe a little bit of our track record in doing it, particularly looking at some of the, the trends we see with respect to soil fertility trends and, and how you know, Lime PK have gone over the last few years. Then I'll explore this 18 tonne per hectare target. Um, and just maybe think a little bit in, for a minute about actually what does that mean in terms of what we're expecting the soil to do for us if we're going to achieve a target like that. Then I, I'll move on particularly some of the, the research that has been done in Chagas Johnstown Castle over the last four to five years, particularly looking at, at pea and lime and the important interaction of them. And it feeds on in terms of, of what we're talking about in terms of soil expectation. And also just very briefly touch a little bit on slurry research update and maybe implications of that as well. And then I'll spend some time looking at, you know, soil fertility obviously is an important part of what we're trying to do in farming, but it's also an investment as well. And just maybe to look at reinforcement our ideas on return on investment as well. In terms of importance of soil, I mean, what we're all about is, is money at the end of the day. We're all, you know, you're all farming, you're trying to make a living, you're trying to make profit, you're trying to do the best you can with the resources you have. And if you think about a cascade of what's important on the route to money, you have obviously what's in the, what's in the milk tank is key in terms of what's going to be in the paycheck at the end of the day. And what's in the milk tank obviously relates back to what's in the cow. And if we come back a step from the cow, if we have very high targets in terms of, of graze grass in the diet and, and utilization from homegrown forage, the grass is obviously the key component there. And if you take really what we're about in terms of, of grass um, yield and grass utilization targets, the two key inputs there really are obviously, Michael O'Donovan is going to talk after me about the importance of what's actually in the grass itself in terms of the setup of the sward and receding and, and all those important aspects of the actual makeup of the sward. But the weather obviously is an uncontrollable factor that we have no control over. But what we need to do is make sure that we have the best sward there in any given year to make best use of the weather that we get. The weather is uncontrollable. The year that we'll do 20 ton, the next year we might do 16. The weather is out of our hands. But certainly we want a sward in terms of the grass species and everything else. That'll be Michael's area. But on fundamentally, what I'm going to deal with is the importance of the soil underneath that to deliver on that potential as well. So the soil plus the sward really are about harvesting whatever the weather can give us to make sure we get best value out of that potential. I just want to focus a little bit on the concept of the value of land versus the value of soil for a minute as well. I mean, we, we get very worked up with the price of land, but it's important to remember land really is only an area designation. In, its sense, in itself, it has no real intrinsic value. But what it does give value is it's, it's actually access to soil is what land is. And land is, or soil is where the value actually is. And the key difference between land is you have to buy land to get more area, but you can manage your soil to make it more valuable. And I suppose over the next 20 minutes, uh, that's what we're talking about in terms of trying to, you know, maximize this, produc this production potential that is in the soil because it's the soil that gives us the real value at the end of the day. And trying to manage and improve that as best as possible is what we're about. We have a lot of people in the audience, probably from the UK and from Northern Ireland, uh, among other places. And just during the course of the talk, I'm going to be talking a lot about, about uh, P and K indexes and the importance of those. And just maybe to, for, you know, uh, you'd be familiar maybe with our own index system. We work on a Morgan's P and a Morgan's K soil test. So we have our, our, our target indexes, which are, you know, index one, two, three, four, index three and four being the higher level index, minimum of index three being the target. But just to bear in mind when, when you're trying to, if, if in the audience you're working that back into your own head to what this means in the UK, our index one is year index naught. Broadly speaking, our index two is year index one. So our index three target would be similar to what the UK or the Northern Ireland would talk about in terms of an index two target. The other target that I'll mention as well, just to set the context, is when we talk about you know, target pH, we're looking at certainly above 6.2, 6.3 in terms of being a minimum target for pH in terms of grassland. So that's by way of background information. But moving on in terms of our track record, you know, we talked about the value of soil. You know, this is where the real intrinsic value is in terms of trying to maximize the value of the land area. And this is just showing a trend in terms of what's happened from, from Chagas data, looking at, at the soil analysis done through Chagas over the last six or seven years. And you can see if you go back to 2007, 2008, the, the blue and the red line there are the percentage of the soils that were analyzed. And this is the, the dairy farms within the data set. So it's about 15,000 samples from dairy farms a year. In 07, 08, 09, we were running at about 40% of the soils that were analyzed were either low in P or K. But by 2012, 13, that level had gone well above 
So we can see that over that four to five year period, we've seen consistent slippage in the soil fertility levels across the country. Now, granted, this is, this is a, it's not a random data set or an absolute measure, but it is a good indicator given the number of samples the Chagas do analyze every year through their advisory services. Also on the pH, the line there is showing the percentage of soils less than pH 6.2. And again, you can see it's, it's maybe not increasing to the same extent as, as the P and K fertility might be uh, causing a problem, but it still is the case that over 60% of soils that are analysed from dairy farms have a pH of less than 6.2. Now, you might look at that graph and say, which well, your 40% of soils are probably okay overall, but actually when you do a further analysis on the data and you look at how much of the soil are deficient in any one of those, or more than one, only 10% of the soils that we analysed in 2013, or the Chagas analysed in 2013, were optimum in terms of fertility being either index 3 or 4 for P and K and being pH above 6.2. Only 10%. And if you're in any doubt about whether it's worth your while soil sampling, that's the only graph you need really from the point of view of showing that on average 9 out of 10 fields are deficient in something. And that's, that's what the data is showing. So it just shows, I suppose, highlights our track record maybe. In, in, in managing soil fertility, but also highlights the importance of getting good information and, and what you do with fertilizer and lime being based on good information as a result. Chagas, you know, on the back of the declining soil fertility and I suppose an increase, to try and increase the awareness about the importance of soil fertility on farms a couple of years ago, you know, really upped the game, I think, in terms of, of, of boosting the information that was going out there in terms of soil fertility. And one of the, the key, I think, strategies at the time in terms of knowledge transfer was highlighting the benefits of soil fertility and the idea of soil fertility management. And farmers very well tuned into grassland management, herd health management and everything else. I think the clear message is that soil fertility deserves equal status there in terms of something that should be managed on the farm. And the five steps that we came up with in terms of managing soil fertility I think are a very good way of, of you know, simplifying how we should think about soil fertility and, and, and the targets that you might set yourself on the farm. And the five steps are very simple. Really, it's about information to start with. It's about having soil test information, doing the soil test on the farm, see where you're starting from, and building a program on top of that then based on good information. The second step, and the, you know, the first thing you should do with any soil test result is look at the lime status and correct the lime and correct the soil pH. The third step is about trying to manage your nutrient inputs relative to what you already have in the soil, and particularly the index system kicks in there. You know, we talk about target index three. If your index, you know, three or four, that has an impact on what you might do with fertilizer compared to if you're low soil fertility, if you're index one or two. And, and so building your fertilizer program on good soil test information is important there as well. Step one is about getting information. Step two and three is about using information in terms of coming up with a plan. And steps four and five are about how you actually implement a plan. And step four is about slurry and managing the resource and nutrients you have within the farm and make sure slurry is targeted around the farm in, in, in the best possible way. And finally, step five is about the actual input of fertilizer and the cost you're going to spend on fertilizer to make sure that the products you're using are the correct balance uh, and are the right products for the job you're trying to do given the situation you're in with your soil fertility and your farming system and so on. So that's just a kind of maybe a recap on that message, but it's a nice simple take home message in terms of five ways you should be thinking, you know, if you're trying to manage soil fertility better. Soil test, lime and pH, what, are, what is my P and K state and then what am I doing with slurry and what fertilizers am I buying and am I doing the right thing at each stage? To move on from that then in terms of a lot of talk this morning, 18 is kind of a magic number in the room today and I was given the challenge or, or, or the title today to talk about removing soil fertility constraints to grow 18 tonne of grass dry matter. And what I want to focus on for a minute is just to kind of set a little bit of context about what that actually means for soil if we're expecting to, to achieve a potential of 18 tonne of, of grass dry matter. So if you take your typical soil and we'll put a target of 18 tonne of dry matter on top of it, I'm going to just look at what is the nutrient uptake that's going to be required by that sward over a, a full year if you're going to get 18 tonne of dry matter above the ground. And I'm using to do this, um, Siobhan Cavanagh did a survey over two years between 2011 and 2013 uh, of grass samples from 100 farms around the country and I'm using the average NPK and sulphur levels in the grass that we measured over that two-year period. Just to work up what 18 tonne means in terms of total uptake in kilos per hectare per year of NPK and sulphur. And the numbers are high. Nitrogen 628, phosphorus 74, potassium 535, and sulphur 52. They are very high numbers in terms of kilos of nutrient per hectare we're expecting our sward to take from the soil into its root system and up, into its, and up into the grass. They are very high numbers. 
put cows on top of that and we'll assume an 80% grass utilisation, again a very high target. That cow will have an offtake from milk. You can argue the numbers about whether it should be kilos of milk solids or, 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 or litres of milk, but let's, uh, let's say it's 18,000 litres of milk with a bit of live weight there for a cow and a calf. Your offtake there is about 110 kilos of N, 20 kilos of P, 31 kilos of K, 5 kilos of S. That's what you're taking out of the farm, that's what you're taking out of the field. The balance of what has been taken up by the sward, whether it's in grass that's not utilised, dying back and being worked back into the soil, or whether it's from the excretion from the animal, either directly a pasture from slurry, the balance going back is, is 518 of N, 54 of P, 504 of K, and 47 of S. We talk about balancing offtake with inputs in terms of fertiliser, and often, particularly for PK, we talk about putting back what you take away in terms of the fertiliser programme. And if you take a fairly high intensi intensive system, following the Chagosk advice, your fertiliser programme for the year in that situation, for a typical index tree situation or where you're trying to just replace offtake and keep the soil fertility at, at, at where it is, you're looking at a programme there somewhere around 250 kilos of N, 23 of P, 40 of K, and 20 of S over the full period. And I suppose that's topping up what we have there going back into the soil from, the, from what's been excreted by the animals and excreted by the grass. But the real point here is that if you think about it, we have available nutrients going in in fertiliser, but we have that massive requirement that the sward is going to need every year, and it leaves us with a fertiliser gap. And if you compare the difference between the uptake and what we're going in with a typical programme, 378 kilos of N, 51 kilos of P, 495 of K and 32 of S, that's what we're expecting the normal nutrient cycling of the soil, be it mineralisation, uh, availability of nutrients that are already in the soil, that's what we're expecting the soil to do for us in the context of an 18 tonne target with a typical fertiliser programme. And the point I'm making is those numbers are very high. Okay? And, you know, it's the, it's the, you know, it's how well the soil is set up in terms of making nutrients that are already in the soil as available as possible, but also recycling the nutrients that are returned in terms of the dead grass and the animal excretion. And we need the soil to be as healthy as possible to try and deliver in terms of gi giving the soil every chance it can to give you the nutrients you're going to need to grow your 18 tonne. And that soil turnover has to be considered again in the context of things like lockup in the soil. You know, we have drivers in the soil in terms of the chemistry of soil and the biology of soil that are pulling nutrients out of an available form and locking them up and taking them away from the plant. You know, that's particularly an issue in terms of, of phosphorus, maybe to a lesser extent for nitrogen and lesser again for S and, 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 and potassium. And the other driver we have to consider is there's losses out of the system. You know, particularly if you take leaching losses, we have, you know, high, relatively high losses in nitrogen and sulfur particularly, probably less, less so for potassium and phosphorus. But really what we're about in terms of managing soil fertility is to make sure that cycle that's going on in the soil is maximised as much as possible, but also that we maximise the re-release of locked up nutrients and we minimise what is either being tied up in the soil and made unavailable and minimise the losses as well. And that's a little bit of the concept. But they're, going back to the point again, that fertiliser gap we're trying to fill is a big challenge for the soil. It's achievable, some farmers are doing it. No problem with the target. But just, we're expecting a lot off the soil and we need to give it every chance it can to do it. That brings me on to talk about, um, you know, some of the research that was done in Johnstown Castle together in very, with Moor Park, especially some of the, the work was, was linked in with Moor Park as well in terms of particularly nutrients like phosphorus and lime and how they interact with the soil in the context of this idea in terms of, of overall soil health and maximising the capacity of the soil to deliver these nutrients. But before I go on, uh, on to that, just, you know, the concept again in terms of nutrient availability, if you take nutrients in a soil, for any nutrient, there's a massive bank of nutrients that are in the soil if you analyse it for total nutrient content. But always there is gradually a lower proportion of those nutrients in what we call the more available pools. So we always we have a lot of nutrients tied up in farms that are very slowly available, but then we have, and we're trying to get as much nutrient as possible into the soluble form, which is what the plant actually needs to take it up. And there are constantly factors in the soil which determine which direction nutrients move within those pools, because it's an ongoing equilibrium. And all the time what we're trying to do is keep as much as possible in the available form to make sure that whatever the grass needs on a given day, it has available to it, available to the roots in a form that it needs to take it up. When we're adding in fertiliser, we're obviously talking about adding it in in either a soluble form, in the case of most chemical fertilisers, or in the case of organic fertilisers, we're back in a more readily available pool, which has the potential to be available, depending on how the soil is dealing with it. In terms of a soil test, really all the soil test is telling you is the capacity of the soil to make the nutrients as available as possible. So really, the soil test as a number in itself 
is an indicator of how, of how available nutrients can be in the soil. And really what we're trying to do is make sure that the arrows are constantly moving to the right in that scenario. That we're minimizing any potential for nutrients like phosphorus to be locked up by fixation by the soil, and we're maximizing the potential for things like nutrients in organic matter to be released and made available to plants. Soil pH, biological activity are probably the two most important factors in the soil which are going to determine which direction nutrients move, whether they're being pulled out of soil solution, made unavailable, or being made available and given back to the plants as a result. Before we talk too much about new experiments, it's important to remember where we're coming from with some of the older experiments. I mean, you know, the information that lime is a good thing, fertilizer is a good thing, is not new information. And just to recap on a few of the headlines from old experiments, 1975, 79, Six experiments on six sites around the country, 20% yield increase with lime was the conclusion of those experiments. 1976 to 79, again, one experiment in Wexford looked at the impact of lime on, on stock carrying capacity. And, you know, compared to an unlime sward, the conclusion was, you know, um, lime application up to optimum rates, 20% increase in stock carrying capacity in year one, 100% increase by year four. The conclusion of all those lime studies at the time, that the main benefit of lime was because of nutrient release, and they related that back to nitrogen, the summary being that proper lime, a uh, proper lime program and optimized soil pH worked somewhere in the order of 60 units of nitrogen per year to you in terms of extra free release of nitrogen from the soil compared to what you'd get if you had no lime applied at all. Moving on to phosphorus and potash, early 80s, experiments done mainly on silage swords, you know, uh, and also on grazing. The Cowlands work in Johnstown Castle, conclusion in the 80s, 15 to 25% reduction in live weight gain where no pea was applied. In the case of, of silage, 50% yield response to P in some of the trials. In the case of K on silage, 15 to 35% yield response to K. Again, all information supporting the idea, you know, of the importance of fertilizers for, for boosting yield, maximizing potential. Moved on to the late 90s, big program on phosphorus in the late 90s. Conclusion there, comparing the yield at index three compared to the yield at index one. Average across eight sites, yield potential increase one and a half tons of dry matter per hectare per year. Again, in a cutting scenario and potentially maybe more in a grazing situation. Sulfur, just to complete the circle there, 1970 and 80s, a lot of work done on sulfur. You know, that concluded 30% of soils were responsive to sulfur. That probably has increased now because we've reduced atmospheric deposition because industry has improved its situation in terms of sulfur emissions from, from industrial production. You know, and also conclusion there, particularly in high-end situations, 30 to 50% yield increases where, high, where sulfur was, was applied, particularly in high-end situations because nitrogen and sulfur are so interrelated in terms of how they work and the importance of sulfur in maximizing the efficiency of nitrogen. So it's important before we talk about new experiments, you know, to consider where we were with old experiments. So moving on from that, you know, to, and to add to that information, this is, is summary work looking at the, the dry matter yield over eight different harvests taken across the year. And this is the average yield on a trial in Johnstown Castle that's conducted over 17 years of data. What we found in terms of yield responses there, there was four rates of P in this experiment, uh, zero up to 45, and the four bars there show the yield with each of the four pea treatments at, at each harvest across the year. Harvest one there started in April up to the, 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 the autumn period. They're numbered rather than months, which is unfortunate there. But, um, you know, 15 kilos per hectare per year of pea, which would be well below maintenance rate in terms of relative to offtakes in that situation. 0.7 of a tonne of dry matter per hectare per year of a yield response on average over the period. 45 kilos per hectare, which would be not quite maintenance, but approaching maintenance. Um, uh, one tonne dry matter per hectare per year response, and that's solely to pea fertilizer. But the key, about, the key outcome of this experiment actually was that that yield response, that tonne of dry matter per hectare per year, is mainly concentrated in the spring period, is where we find the main benefit of the extra yield. Moving on, an, another experiment we conducted, this was, this was an experiment started in, um, there was two sites on this, was one in Moorpark and one in Johnstone Castle. This is the results from Johnstone Castle. This experiment had four rates of phosphorus, 0, 20, 40, 60 and two rates of lime, so either with or without lime. Um, and what you can see there again, the yield response to phosphorus, and this would, there are the yields over a year and a half, so that's why the, the, the yield data there up to 24 tonne of dry matter is, is quite high, but that's a harvest period inclusive of, of um, June 2011 right through to October 2012. But over that period, you know, 1,200 kilo dry matter per hectare um, response in terms of phosphor, response to phosphorus fertilizer, and a 600 kilo dry matter per hectare response to lime. So overall, over the year and a half, a two-ton yield response for the combined program of P and lime herd were applied together. And again, I have the data shown, but again, looking at the individual harvests along that experiment, again, pointing to the importance of P and lime at the time of, first of all, receding, because it was, it was a newly established sward that we set up to do that experiment, but also the first harvest of the second year, 
was the time of the year when we saw the biggest response in terms of yield to the pea and the lime treatments. I talked about the importance of setting the soil up as much as possible. Okay, setting the soil up as much as possible to, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the importance of something like pH to maximise the nutrient availability. And this was an experiment we did just with a lab incubation study where we looked at the change in soil test phosphorus over 12 months, where lime was applied or where phosphorus was applied. The first thing I'd say there, if you look at the blue bar, that was the difference in Morgan's P across 16 soils. So the increase in the soil test P level when phosphorus was applied. And obviously, as you would expect, there was more, the soil test increased where you put on the phosphorus. But the one I really want to point is the second bar there, which is the lime treatment, where we saw that even in the absence of any phosphorus, we saw an increase in the soil test phosphorus result just because of the lime application. And again, showing the importance of lime and pH in the overall story of pea availability as an example of what lime can do to maximize um, nutrient availability. And likewise, in the, fourth bar, in, the, in, the, in the last bar across where you had lime and pea together, you get the additive benefits of both. Lime and pea very closely related, and if you're interested in maximizing pea availability and maximizing efficiency of fertilizer pea, lime is key. This is the, the same story, but the last, the last slide was a lab incubation experiment. This is real field data from, 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 from a field experiment. And again, it's just showing each of the, the, the dark green bar is the soil test phosphorus um, compared to the light green bar where soil test phosphorus was measured, where lime was applied as well as phosphorus fertilizer. The red line is the starting soil test phosphorus level in that experiment, which is about 4.8. And you can see for every single P treatment, the soil test phosphorus a year and a half later was higher where lime was applied along with the phosphorus than where phosphorus was applied on its own. So again, more, more indication of the importance of lime and pH for overall nutrient availability. And really the key point is, there is no point going after um, increase in soil P and K fertility, particularly P fertility, if you don't fix the lime first and just fix the soil pH first. Another key important issue in terms of, of uh, phosphorus is P concentration in herbage. And it is an important uh, objective in terms of P fertilizer program to make sure that we maximize the P concentration in herbage to make sure it's sufficient in terms of the dietary requirements of the cow when grass is the complete diet. This is survey data again from Siobhan Kavanagh showing that while there isn't any major issue, we, we set a target of 3.5 as a P requirement for cows, there isn't a major issue in terms of on average across the country for P level in herbage, but if there is an issue on individual farms, it is the summer period where that's going to manifest. And that creates us with, with an issue in terms of we know we need P in the, in the system for early grass yield, but if you want to keep P concentration up in the summer, how do we manage that in terms of um, a P fertilizer program which can do that as well? And we set up this experiment um, which looked at two options. The green bar there is the result, is the P concentration in herbage across different harvest periods in the year when no P is applied. The solid blue bar is where P is applied as a single application in spring. And the dashed blue bar is where we split the same annual application but split it over four timings during the early spring and into the summer. And the main conclusion I want to show here is yes, the trend in terms of P concentration followed what you would expect that it's lower in summer. But the key one was that we did increase the P concentration in herbage in July by applying a split application of P rather than applying it all together in one application early in the spring. We found no difference in the yield between the treatments, but we did find a difference in pea concentration in summer. So basically to summarize that pea work, we find pea in the spring is critical for yield, but pea, a little bit of pea in the summer is critical also to make sure the pea in the herbage is sufficient to meet the cow's needs. But fundamentally, lime and pH are important as an underlying factor when you're going to do with phosphorus. That leads us to consider what do you do with a fertilizer program of P and K then? And I'd be suggesting that what you, to set up a fertilizer program for optimized P and K, you want to be looking at a situation where you're getting at least 50% of the annual phosphorus requirement out early in the spring, at least 50%. You're looking at a high, P comp, high PK compound to do that. You're 10, 10, 20s, 18, 6, 12, something in that territory. But hold back somewhere between 25 up to 50% of the P for a split application during the summer. And this approach tries to get the double benefit of making sure there's enough P in the system early in the year for maximizing the early grass growth, but hold back a little bit to make sure there's no issue with pea concentration in the summer, particularly where we're driving on grass yield as much as possible. If you're going with extra pea for build-up, go in with it early, because the benefit will be in early grass. That ton extra ton of grass, if you can grow it in the spring, is the most valuable in the year. So target the extra pea early if it's needed. If you need extra K for build-up, target it late in the year. Think about the compounds you're using. You know, if you're in a high K situation where you don't need K, think about an, N0, an NP0 compound. If you're in a high P situation where you don't need the P but you need the K, there are options there with N0Ks, so consider those as well. 
Also think about your product ratio and particularly think about slurry because slurry is a very well balanced fertilizer for silage but there has been a tendency to go a lot of slurry on grazing ground where pea, particularly where pea was restricted with nitrate situations but a lot of slurry on grazing ground unless there's a situation on grazing where you need a lot of extra K may not be the best scenario for slurry so generally speaking slurry is best timed in terms of a, a, a silage sward rather than a grazing sward. Sulphur, timing of sulphur, the old theory on sulphur was that it was very much, um, uh, the response to sulphur was more towards late summer, but more and more the considered opinion seems to be that you want to be targeting sulphur applications starting in probably early April right through until, until June. And, you know, and the N plus S products are very good in terms of doing that. If you're talking about receding, I'd say any sward you're going to receding, I would always target P at the time of receding. So in terms of flitting P across the year, I'd hold back all my pea and put it on at the time of receding because receding is a critical time in terms of phosphorus availability. Slurry, I'm going to skip through a couple of slides, but the, the, the one I just want to focus on is this one. It's useful to think of slurry in terms of maximizing its value, in terms of its value as in terms of 50 kilo bags. And if you take, um, you know, a typical 7% dry matter slurry, that's going to be equivalent in a 50 kilo bag to a product like 5430. And what we have seen actually over the last few years is that the nutrient content in slurry does seem to be slipping a little bit, as you would expect to reduce fertilizer inputs. We're talking about spring application there. If you're going hot, dry weather, you could take three units of N off, off that. So your, your 5, 430 would become, for example, 2, 430 in the summer rather than applying it in the spring. If you're going with band spread or trailing shoe, you could be adding three units of N per 1,000 gallons there. But the key message on slurry, I think, which is an important take-home message, you know, Years ago, there was a lot of emphasis on silage, and farms were very much designated between silage areas and grazing areas. More and more now, the silage is coming out as a, as a way of managing grass, which means our silage yields are much more variable, which means we have to be a bit more dynamic with the advice that we're given on a silage sward. And as a rule of thumb, if you're in a situation where you're taking out paddocks for silage, obviously there's more P and K being taken out of that field in that situation. And as a rule of thumb, for every ton of dry matter you take out of a paddock in, in a silage, in maybe taking it out for bales or whatever, you need to go back in with about 700 gallons per acre of an application of slurry per tonne of dry matter of grass that you're taking out to replace the P and K. And it's, it's a useful, so if you're taking out a paddock that has three tonne on it, you need just over 2,000 gallons per acre of, of a 7% dry matter slurry to neutralize that. But that 700 per tonne of dry matter is a useful, um, is a useful thing to remember. Finally, um, just to talk about return on investment, because obviously we're talking about increasing soil fertility and we want to drive it on in terms of, you know, that is a cost in the system, but we want to make sure that we're getting money back for that cost. You know, fertilizer costs typically 20% of your variable costs. You know, it's nearly, it's not just in dairy, nearly across all the, the farm enterprises, 20% of total variable costs is a good baseline in terms of where fertilizer usually sits. It's good value for money where used correctly, but if the rates are either too low, too high, or not in balance, you're not going to be getting the best bang for your book out of that. And I suppose the options, it's about taking soil test results and it's about using them and doing the right thing with fertilizer as a result. In terms of P and K advice, we talk about replacing offtake at a target index. You know, I won't dwell too long on these, but just to introduce it, because I'm, go I'm, I'm going to be taking a, some of the higher end stocking rates to look at a scenario where we look at return on investment. But you're looking there, you know, at stocking rates of two and a half to three cows per hectare, which would be typical enough at the high end, 23 kilos of P and 40 kilos of K, typical maintenance rates of phosphorus that need to be going back in to replace the offtake from the milk in that situation. Silage offtake rates are higher. Granted, they're usually put back by the slurry that's already on the farm. But again, you know, first cut silage, five to, six ton, uh, five to six ton of dry matter yield per hectare, 20 kilos of P, 125 kilos of K is what's required. Second cut, again, depending on yield, slightly lower rates, but you can take it that a ton of silage dry matter is taken out about four kilos of P and 25 kilos of K in terms of the requirement to go back in with fertilizers as a result. If you're talking about a build-up situation for index two, you're adding to the maintenance rate 10 kilos of P and 30 kilos of K and you're doubling that, you're adding 20 kilos of P and 60 kilos of K in the situation where you're trying to build up K. That's just to set the context. Um, sulfur, again, the advice, 20 kilos per, per hectare per year per, for a grazing sward, or 20 kilos per hectare per cut for a silage sward would be the standard advice for sulfur. The reason I talk about those figures is I want to look at the return on investment from a fertilizer program, where we have, again, looking at that high-end program, I mentioned it earlier, 250 kilos of N, 23 kilos of P, 40 kilos of K, and 20 kilos of S. Typical cost per unit of, of, of nutrient, 120 for N, 2 euros for K, a euro for, or sorry, 2 euros for P, a euro for K, and 50 cent for sulfur. And looking at a, a lime program of about three quarters of, a kilo, three quarters of a ton per hectare per year of lime. So that would add up to a, every five year an application of somewhere between two and a half and five 
tonnes per hectare per year, which would be typical enough in terms of a requirement, and take in line with 20 euros per tonne. Return on investment. If we just ignore P&K and we say, right, it's going to be a deer fertiliser year, we say we're not going to worry about P&K for this year, we're going to go straight NNS. Your NNS programme for that, so your 250 kilos of N and your 20 kilos of sulphur, it's going to cost you a 310 euros per kilo, based on those rough, rough guidelines of prices. Now, what's the return on investment of going the extra step for lime and P&K maintenance? Take lime. Lime is really a no-brainer. If you're talking about lime, the cost there per hectare, extra 15 euros would be the annualised cost. Yes, it's higher in the year that you, you spread the lime, but an annualised cost of 15 euros is probably ballpark what, what, where you need to be. You're adding 15 euros onto your programme. I'm using a slightly higher figure than I was talking about this morning, dimension 160 this morning, I have 180 there. But you're talking a very low break-even yield to justify that extra cost on lime. 0.1 of a tonne of dry matter per hectare. And I'd argue an assumption of even for lime on its own of a tonne of dry matter per hectare is certainly not out of the water in terms of what could be expected. And at a yield benefit of a tonne per hectare, you're looking at a net gain over cost there per hectare of 166 euros. Add to that then a P&K maintenance program. We go the extra step now. We've sorted out lime and we're looking at P&K maintenance. Again, your maintenance program between P and K is going up at a marginal cost of about 86 euros per hectare. Your break-even yield in that situation is still only about, a ton, about half a ton of dry matter per hectare. You know, and I'd argue no problem. Really, your, your PK maintenance program, your yield benefit there is preventing any slippage back into low fertility where yield will suffer. And I'd certainly stand over a figure in the order of three quarters of a ton of dry matter per hectare. You know, as a summary from the research that we've done, is a reasonable yield benefit to assume there. And again, your, your net gain you're easily in net gain territory here with a, with a benefit value of 136 over, over a marginal cost of 86 euros for your P&K maintenance. As you move on into low fertility situations, as you move from index 3 to index 2 or index 2 to index 1, the marginal cost there for that extra build-up rate, you're talking 50 euros per hectare for each index. But again, your increase is here because your yield potential from taking a sword from index 1 to index 3 or index 2 to index 3, again, as you slip back into the lower, the worse your soil fertility gets, the greater benefit there in terms of yield potential. But in terms of, you know, the overall picture summarising all three, if you're taking it from a low PK situation, you know, rock bottom, your marginal cost of lime plus maintenance plus all the build-up, you're talking about 200 euros. So it is significant. But still your break-even yield is only about a little over one tonne of dry matter per hectare. And I'd certainly stand over a scenario where you could expect when you get the grass sward right, as well to make sure the sward is sufficient to maximise the benefit, I'd say three tonne there is certainly achievable um, uh, in terms of a, a guide in terms of, of looking at return on investment. And again, for a marginal cost of 200 on those figures, you're looking at a benefit value of 543 and a net gain of 342, well over two to one in terms of return on investment for the extra cost of the lime and the extra cost of the fertiliser. You know, and that's the typical scenario you're going to be looking at where your farm might be sitting at maybe 12 tonne per hectare and you're trying to get it to 15. You know, if those are the targets that you're going, to, you're going to be achieving, return on investment, I think, is certainly justifiable in that case. The other thing to remember is that when we talk about index one and two, you know, we're talking about probably a medium-term investment there because it is an ongoing investment for a number of years. But once the soil is built to index three, the benefits are long-term for a medium-term increase in the investment cost. And that's an important thing to remember as well, that over time when you build it back up, you know, you have the benefits of those yield increases long-term but you don't have the sustained cost or, or, you know, forever in that situation. Return on investment for soil sample, I, 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 maybe not for this audience, but there are some farmers out there who still couldn't justify the cost of the soil sample. Now, if you take a soil sample costing 25 euros and you're doing it every four hectares every four years, you're getting 16 hectare years out of a soil sample. The cost per hectare is 156 per hectare per year. And the difference between the programs that you might put in based on the soil test you know, everything fine and only, you're talking 300 euros per hectare of a cost, versus if you're low in everything, you could wind up after the soil test spending 500 euros per hectare. And I would argue that the spend of 1 euro 56 per hectare in a soil test is insignificant when it's the difference of making sure that extra 200 euros is either spent, very, is either spent wisely or saved wisely. Finally, um, I was a little bit uncomfortable on my seat a little bit. I was in the comfortable position maybe uh, four months ago working for Chagask. I was part of this great independent organisation. I've moved to the, to the commercial side of the house, which has um, been maybe talked about in a slightly different light this morning. But certainly, look, at I'm in a commercial company. Our company is selling fertiliser. But we are a company that's committed. We're certainly at the end of the inputs in farming where we're driving, you know, 
we, we are fully on board with the target in terms of increasing grass growth, increasing grass utilisation. Our company is about helping farmers to do that. And, you know, we're not in the business of dumping fertiliser on yards, collecting our money and not helping farmers use it properly. And we do have guys who are available and we're rolling out a system. This is an example this year where, you know, we're trying to improve all the time the usefulness of information to try and help farmers use fertilisers as best they can. And this is just one example of the type of output we're, we're producing for farmers this year in terms of fertiliser programmes where we're, we're helping farmers come up with programmes which are based on good solid advice, mainly on the, Chagas, on, on the Chagask advice, but good solid advice translating that into a suitable programme with fertilisers which maximises the potential benefit for your fertiliser input. Finally, summary thoughts. If you have soil samples, have you used them? I know a lot of you, maybe the tide is changing, I think, for the better in, in this in the last couple of years, but certainly there was a scenario in a lot of cases where an awful lot of soil samples were taken in this country and used only for reps or only for derogation and not really put to good use for fertilizer management. And I, I'd say, if you don't have them, you need to get soil test results. And if you do have them, use them and try and use them as best you can. You've paid for them, you've made the investment, get as much as you can back out of them. You know, and you know, that 90% that of soil samples indicate some fertility issue just highlights the importance of engaging with soil sample results and using them as a tool to guide what you're doing with fertilizer. Is the lack of lime an issue on your farm? You know, I've presented the challenge that we're expecting soil to do. I fully believe in the potential of soil to do it, but we need to be aware of what we're asking the soil to do and we need to give the soil every chance we can to do that. And lime, soil pH management, you know, making sure the soil is as healthy as possible in terms of its, its, its structure, its biology, its pH, all those factors very important. Lime is certainly a key and fundamental ingredient to do that and it's a very low cost ingredient to do that. You know, the benefits are there, 60 units of N per acre, um, going back to the work from, from the 70s and 80s. You know, efficiency of P build up and availability. You know, the indications are clear why lime is so important. And there's no point going after P and K fertility problems if you're not going after the lime problem as well and the pH problem as well. Are you using enough or are you using too much P, K and sulfur? Are they in the right balance? Have you really looked at your fertilizer program Am I using the right amount of each nutrient in the proportional quantities in, to each other at the right time of the year? You know, applications need to be balanced in terms of the requirements. You know, grazing and silage or different fields need to be treated differently. Different fields with different soil test results are indicating you need to do different things with fertilizer. The yield benefits are there. Pea fertilizer, for example, going back to that, 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 that 17 year experiment, a ton of extra dry grass, a ton of extra dry matter per hectare is there for the taking in the spring. Optimized, would, optimize P, um, would optimize P nutrition. Combined potential lime PK program, I've, I've presented in the order of three ton per hectare per year in terms of benefit potential there. If we're going after this 18 ton, certainly the soil fertility is a key parameter along the way to do that. You know, and in terms of return on investment, you know, I've shown there, based on that three ton expectation of yield, no problem guaranteeing two, two full return on investment from the extra soil fertility. And again, that particularly in the case of you know, P and K build up, for example. Always remember that's a medium term investment for a long term benefit. And that's an important to remember the context of that as well. Finally, just to acknowledge um, colleagues in Chagas who would have been, you know, the, the, the generators of a lot of the information that I've summarized here today, you know, doc, Drs. David Wall, Tim Scheel, Patricia Berry, Siobhan Cavan, and Mark Plunkett, and all the staff in Johnstown Castle just for all the, the work and support they would have given me in terms of the research that I've presented. And just to acknowledge those there as well. So, Mr. Chairman, that's what I have to say for now.